Hello and welcome to eBible Fellowship's Evening Bible Studies with your speaker, Chris McCann. If you'd like more information or to hear more studies, visit our website at www.ebiblefellowship.com. And now, with your evening Bible study, here's Chris McCann. Good evening and welcome to eBible Fellowship's Bible Study in the Book of Revelation. Tonight is study number two of Revelation chapter nine, and we're going to be reading the first two verses. And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth, and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit, and there arose a smoke out of the pit, as the smoke of a great furnace, and the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. In our last study, we saw how the Bible uh, speaks of the Lord Jesus Christ as having the keys that open and none can shut and that shut and that none can open. And we also find in Revelation chapter 1 um, that God tells us this in verse 18. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. Now, that's um, very important because we we read in Revelation 9-1 that this star that fell from heaven was given the key of the bottomless pit. And now, according to Revelation 1-18, that the Lord Jesus Christ possesses keys for hell and death. And if you remember, back in Revelation chapter 6, when we were going through the, the four horses, and we saw that the pale horse identified with Judgment Day, and God said of that in Revelation 6, uh, in verses 7 and 8, and when he had opened the fourth seal... I heard the voice of the fourth beast say, Come and see. And I looked, and behold, a pale horse. And his name that sat on him was Death, and Hell followed with him. And power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth to kill with sword and with hunger and with death and with the beasts of the earth. And we uh, went through this and, and spent a little time where... Uh, we saw that God likens Judgment Day, our present period of time, to the rider on the pale horse, and and his name was Death, and Hell followed with him. Now, why would the Bible uh, do that? Why would God link together Death and Hell with um, the period of Judgment Day? Well, as we're seeing here in Revelation 9, the Lord Jesus Christ, who is spoken of as the great star that fell from heaven, he has the key of the bottomless pit in verse 1, and then in verse 2, he opens the bottomless pit, and Revelation 1.18 tells us that he has the keys of hell and death. And in effect, what Christ has done is he has loosed hell and death upon the earth in the day of judgment so that the world begins to take upon itself the characteristic of hell and death. Or to say it in another way, what was true of that bottomless pit. And, and the bottomless pit does identify with death and hell is now true of the earth because once the bottomless pit was open, notice in verse 2, there arose a smoke out of the pit as the smoke of a great furnace, and the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. The smoke is arising, that is coming up, and uh, the smoke is affecting the world, the sun is that which shines down upon the world. The air is that which people breathe in the physical level in the world. And, and so the smoke came up out of the pit and now has turned the world into 
um, a smoking furnace. And, and that was the condition of the pit. So hell, which was beneath, below, and the Bible often speaks of hell as descending into it, has risen and come up to where earth is, where the people of earth are. And, and that's because, well, now the people of the earth are under the wrath of God. And uh, we're going to take a little time and um, concentrate on this, so, so hopefully we'll understand it very well. This is actually uh, an extremely important teaching that God is giving to us, and it will also affect other uh, doctrines, other understandings later on concerning the true believers. Because once the earth takes upon itself the condition of hell and death, which it has, well, where are the believers? The believers are on the earth living in the day of judgment. Therefore, it is as though the believers are living uh, uh, in a place that has taken upon itself the condition of hell and death. That's very unusual, isn't it? And, and that uh, really leads to some very interesting um, developments concerning God's final end time plan uh, to bring about the resurrection and, and the end of this world and so forth. But right now, let's just think about our verse in Revelation 9.1. And we saw that the Lord Jesus is uh, typified as this star that fell from heaven unto the earth. The earth is the object of the wrath of God. And to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. And that's the key of hell and death. And so the Lord Jesus, the only one who possesses this key, Satan has nothing to do with loosing um, hell and death upon the earth. He, he is a fallen angel. He's a rebel himself that God is judging and God is not uh, using him at all to uh, open up the pit, the, the bottomless pit. And, and that's what we want to think about. What is this bottomless pit? Well, let's start with the word bottomless. And uh, this is uh, a Greek word that's translated only as bottomless here. Now, there, there's two different uh, Greek words. Bottomless is one and pit is another. Now, in other places where the Greek word translated as bottomless in Revelation 9.1 is used, you'll find that... Um, it, well, it's translated as deep two times, and it's translated as bottomless pit, both words, several times. But here in Revelation 9.1, it's only translated as bottomless, and then another word is added for the word pit. The word bottomless is Strong's number 12, and it's translated as deep in the Gospel of Luke in Luke chapter 8 and in verse 30, I'll start reading there. And Jesus asked him, saying, What is thy name? And he said, Legion, because many devils were entered into him. And they besought him that he would not command them to go out into the deep. Now this is the, the Greek word that's translated as bottomless, uh, abysso from which we get the, the English word, the abyss. Uh, and the, the demons, this legion of demons that had entered into this man, they were fearful that the Lord Jesus might cast them into the abyss, into the deep, into the bottomless pit. And uh, yet at this time, Christ did not. Uh, he... He instead allowed them to enter into the herd, and then that herd ran violently down into the sea. And that's a picture of what the Lord will do with the demons, and uh, did do very uh, shortly thereafter with Satan at the cross. And yet it is a word here that is um, 
on a physical level identifying with the sea, and yet spiritually there's something else in view. In Romans chapter 10, in Romans 10, it's also translated as deep, and here we read in verse 6, But the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise, Say not in thine heart, Who shall ascend into heaven? That is, to bring Christ down from above. Or, who shall descend into the deep? That is, to bring up Christ again from the dead. And, and here, uh, this is, um, uh, the, the word deep is the same Greek word, Strong's number 12, that is translated as bottomless in Revelation 9, 1, and bottomless pit in some other verses in the book of Revelation. And here it is describing the Lord Jesus Christ um, going down. And remember, he uh, is said to have been in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. And that typified his experience of paying uh, the penalty from the foundation of the world for the sins of his elect and it typified the demonstration that he performed when he entered into the human race. And, and then when he went into the Garden of Gethsemane that Thursday evening, and, and then Friday evening and Saturday evening were the three nights, and then Friday, Saturday, and early Sunday morning rising from the dead were the three days. And so, who shall descend into the deep? That is to bring up Christ again from the dead. And here God is linking the word deep to dead, to death. And, and that identifies also with hell and the grave. And, and, and so that's an important um, um, joining together of ideas that this word identifies with death. And and by the way, back in the book of Jonah, as, as uh, the Lord Jesus did refer to Jonah, uh, being in the whale's belly for three days and three nights, and so would the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth, we find in Jonah chapter 2, it says in verse 1, Then Jonah prayed unto Jehovah his God out of the fish's belly. And said, I cried by reason of mine affliction unto Jehovah. And he heard me out of the belly of hell, cried I. And thou heardest my voice, for thou hast cast me into the deep, in the midst of the seas. And the floods compassed me about all my billows and thy waves passed over me. Then I said, I am cast out of thy sight, yet I will look again toward thy holy temple. The waters compassed me about even to the soul. The depth closed me round about. The weeds were wrapped about my head. I went down to the bottoms of the mountains. The earth with her bars was about me forever. Yet hast thou brought up my life from corruption, O Jehovah my God. And here, this is when Jonah was in the midst of the whale's belly. And notice the language that the Bible says, out of the belly of hell, Sheol, cried I. And, and then that is joined together with the next phrase in verse 3, for thou hast cast me into the deep, in the midst of the seas. And then the idea of eternity. I went down to the bottoms of the mountains. The earth with her bars was about me forever. And, and this is joining the idea of the abyss, the deep as we read in Romans 10, 7, with hell, the grave. And also in Romans 10, 7, death was also joined together with that idea. And, and that's what we read of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the keys of hell and death. He himself has experienced hell and death when he died as the lamb slain from the foundation of the world for the sins of his people. And he died, therefore he went into hell, the grave, and death. And then he rose again from the dead and was declared to be the Son of God via the resurrection of the dead. And, 
and that also was before or from the foundation of the world. And so as the Son, he then, uh, uh, since he was declared to be the Son through the resurrection of the dead, then as the Son of God, he created this world and universe. And, and so the Lord Jesus Christ has personal experience with the deep or with the bottomless pit. And that bottomless pit comes into view again in the book of Revelation, in Revelation chapter 20. And here um, it, it's found twice. This is, again, Strong's number 12. And it's only translated as bottomless in Revelation 9.1. But here in Revelation 20, in verse 1 and 3, it, that one Greek word is translated as both the bottomless pit, or two English words. And it says in Revelation 20, verse 1, I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit. Now, who would that be? That is the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, Revelation 3, 7 Revelation 118 confirm that there is no question about that that the Lord Jesus is the angel coming down from heaven just as he is typified as the star that came down from heaven in Revelation 8 and in Revelation 9 having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand and he laid hold on the dragon and uh, that is, he arrested him. He stopped him from his activities or performing the activities um, without restraint that he had been able to do prior to this point or without certain restraints. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. And here is a reference to what happened to Satan at the cross? And uh, a little later, we're going to uh, think about why this happened at the cross. But right now, it's just enough for us to know that this is a reference to Satan's binding at the cross because he was defeated by the Lord Jesus Christ. And now God had a plan to evangelize the world and to use the churches to uh, reach many more people of the nations through the church age and through the gospel going into all the world and the establishing of churches, the establishing of the word of God all over the earth. And in order to accomplish this, God's plan included the binding of Satan to prevent him from uh, stopping the plan of God. Of course, Satan would would continue to exist, continue to go about as a roaring lion, continue even to infiltrate the churches and turn some of them into synagogues of Satan. And he would be very active in that way, sowing tares amongst the wheat. But this binding meant that he could not stop the spread of the gospel as he was previously able to do, and he could not hinder God from accomplishing his purpose in saving the first fruits, the 144,000, or, or, which were typified by the 144,000. And so he was limited now in his activities for the thousand years. And the thousand years, it was not a literal thousand years, we know that, and, um, you know, some people, just to make this point, some people say, well, it wasn't until after uh, May 21, 2011 that you started saying it was a spiritual uh, judgment. You, you weren't saying that before. And that's because we didn't know that in, we didn't have that information before. We didn't realize it. And likewise, likewise, if we were living at the time from 33 AD to 1033 AD, and we had read this verse that Satan would be bound for a thousand years, you had better believe that we would have been on guard watching around the year 1033 AD for the loosing of Satan. 
and then nothing would have happened, nothing different than 1032 or 100 years before that, and nothing happened uh, at all. And that taught the believers over the course of history that this could not be literal. It, it, it was not a literal thousand years. It must be a figurative period of time. And so there's nothing wrong with learning things after the fact. Sometimes we, we can't help it. We're, we're uh, finite creatures. We have feet of clay. And it takes going past a certain point to come to a, a better understanding. And, and God just factors all these things into his plan of revealing truth to his people. And so after the literal thousand years has come and gone, there is no other solution but a figurative or spiritual uh, representation of a thousand years. And then when we look at how God uses the number thousand or hundred or ten or ten thousand in the Bible, we find he uses it to represent completeness of whatever is in view. And, and therefore, this is referring to the complete binding of Satan during the New Testament age, church age, and that turned out to be 1955 years, almost 2,000 years. And yet God speaks of it as a thousand years. And so the angel, the, the messenger that came down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand, laid hold on the dragon and bound him a thousand years. And then in verse 3, and cast him into the bottomless pit. And that's the, the Greek word abysso. Our word in Revelation 9 verse 1. And cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up. And set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that he must be loosed a little season. So Christ, who has the key and opens, and no man can shut, and shuts, and no man can open. He took a hold of Satan at the cross in 33 AD and cast him into a bottomless pit. But of course, as mentioned, Satan continued to go around on the earth as a roaring lion. He, he was not removed into some place somewhere. It uh, had nothing to do with a place, but it was a condition. It was a spiritual condition uh, that had changed, not his location, not his place. The, the Bible's um, very clear that, that Satan continued to roam the earth and was never uh, put in some place called hell or anything like that, but rather a condition prevailed over him that God spoke of as being as though he were in a bottomless pit and shut up. And it was as if this chain that the Lord Jesus Christ had here was wrapped about him, constraining him, and, and holding him fast, and he could not get free. He was a prisoner, and uh, he would remain so for a thousand years, or for the 1955 years of the church age until 1988 A.D., and then he must be loosed for a little season, and a little season is a reference to the Great Tribulation period. And we, we find in uh, Revelation 11, in verses 6 and 7, it says there, These have power to shut heaven, that it rain not in the days of their prophecy, and have power over waters to turn them to blood, and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. And that's speaking of the two witnesses. Then in verse 7, And when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. And notice that the, uh, the testimony of the two witnesses concludes 
exactly at the point when Satan's binding of a thousand years concludes. He is bound for a thousand years, then he must be loosed a little season. And in Revelation 11, verse 7, we see his ascension. He ascends out of the bottomless pit. That is the point of his loosing. And he immediately goes after the two witnesses or the witness of the word of God within the churches and congregations of the world. And now, though, now it's God's plan to allow Satan victory. And he is victorious over them. And so he um, makes war against them, overcomes them, and kills them. That is speaking, again, of the witness of the law and the prophets, the word of God within the congregations. The Holy Spirit left the church, and this allowed Satan to win. And now he is the man of sin that has taken his seat in the temple. This is the point of Satan's ascending. And, you know, as people try to make this apply to May 21, 2011, they are way off course because this language is speaking of the beginning of the Great Tribulation. It's speaking of a time when Satan is victorious, and that's because God wanted him to be, a time when the true believers are defeated, and the word of God, the witness of the word of God within the congregations is defeated because God desired for this to happen within his plan. And to apply this to May 21, 2011 is, is just totally incorrect. May 21, 2011 was not a day of victory for Satan. It was not a time of defeat for the believers or for the word of God. Actually, it, those things are reversed. May 21, 2011, at the conclusion of the Great Tribulation, is when Satan's period of ruling and reigning in the congregations comes to an end, when he is put down, and when God has concluded his salvation program and saved the last of the elect, when he has won the greatest of victories over the kingdom of Satan. And, and so these verses have nothing to do with that. And people continue to misapply them because of outward things and the way they felt on May 21 and the way people looked at them and they think, well, this means our witness is dead. That has nothing to do with it. This is speaking of the death of the two witnesses in 1988, the law and the prophets, the ministry of the gospel within the churches and congregations, and only that. It is not making uh, reference or having anything to do with May 21, 2011. Well, we see here that Satan ascends, and in order for him to ascend, the Lord Jesus had to once again open up the pit. He is the one that cast Satan into it. He is the one that shut him up and no man can open. Therefore, as the Bible said there, he after the thousand years are fulfilled, he must be loosed a little season, which means that Christ again return and as it were put the key in the lock and let him go free, and and he went immediately after the people of God. That's what Satan does naturally, and and so uh, Satan himself did not have the key, but Christ uh, utilized the key. And as the Lord Jesus opened the pit and cast him in, and then shut it up, and then as the Lord Jesus opened the pit to release him. Christ is the one with the key and no one else. Well, we'll continue uh, looking at these interesting things and see how it relates to what we're reading in Revelation 9 in our next study of the Bible. Thanks for joining us for eBible Fellowship's Evening Bible Studies. You can hear these studies Monday through Friday over PalTalk, Skype, eBible Fellowship's webcast audio, or over your phone. 
For more information or to hear other studies, visit www.ebiblefellowship.com. Until our next study, may the Lord's perfect will be done.